All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Team Kentucky update. It's been about a week, maybe a week and a half. I want to thank everybody for giving me a little time with my kids and to read through hundreds upon hundreds of bills that given the number of past, I might be the only person who has read through. But today, um, we're going to start with the continued great news for Kentucky, which is an economy on fire. As many of you know, last year, we didn't just break, we shattered every economic development record in the books, and the progress continues. Every week, every month, we continue to see wonderful opportunities with new companies picking us for the biggest investments in their history and employers that are already in Kentucky, showing the confidence that they can do so much more. So today I'm happy to start by highlighting several recent economic development announcements as we continue to build on last year's record year and create the economy of the future that my two kids and a number of the kids that are here today will grow up in and truly um, believing that we have a chance to become a top 10 economy in the United States of America. So first, we have f &E Aircraft Maintenance LLC, better known as uh, FEM Aero. This company is an aircraft maintenance and engineering services provider that currently employs 300 people at CVG Airport in Boone County. Last week, we announced that the company is growing its presence in Northern Kentucky in a significant and an exciting way with 250 high wage jobs, including at least 124 Kentucky resident positions. But since we're announcing it here again today, maybe we can add a few out of those 250 to that. This has an average hourly wage, get this, of $38.50, including benefits, great jobs for the people of Northern Kentucky. Femaro is solidifying its place as a quality employer in the Commonwealth for years to come. This move is the latest in more than a $40 million investment that will allow the company to construct a new three-bay hangar to house Boeing 767 aircraft upon their completion in 2023. The new hangar will support a variety of positions, including aircraft mechanics and technicians, ground support equipment mechanics, administrative personnel, and management roles. And it will further Femaro's support of cargo hubs like Amazon, that is the largest project in Amazon's history. It's in Kentucky, as well as DHL, which I believe is its largest presence in the United States, if not close to it. Kentucky's distribution and logistics sector is a key factor to our attraction of other businesses, but its growth continuing shows just how much our economic presence and growth is pushing even more jobs in this area. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Femaro COO Wayne Sisson. Wayne, uh, who is a veteran, and we appreciate your service, and his team have shown tremendous commitment to the Commonwealth and our talented workforce, so I want to thank you for everything you're doing in Kentucky, knowing it's your largest operation, maybe even the crown jewel uh, of, of the company. So we'd like to invite uh, Wayne to share a few words, and we can't thank you enough. Thank you, Governor. Uh, honor to be here. Um, I'd like to start with a, a, a brief um, um, expression of gratitude uh, for the organizations that are supporting us uh, and collaborating with us. Uh, firstly, to Governor Bashir and your administration, uh, certainly to um, the uh, Kentucky Economic Development uh, Finance uh, Authority, uh, Northern Kentucky Triad, and certainly the professionals at CBG Airport uh, who we've been working with uh, for a number of years. Very exciting times uh, for FEM uh, with the growth and the opportunities that we're uh, providing uh, and creating there uh, with your support. So thank you. Uh, key benefits, as the governor said, will be in excess of 200 uh, high-tech, high-paying jobs. Uh, this is in addition to the circa 300 uh, employees we have there today. So we're very proud of that. And we're very proud of the uh, product offering that will uh, bring our customers, uh, fundamentally DHL and uh, Amazon, uh, and all the airlines uh, that, that perform for them. Uh, what it means to uh, FEM um, and, and their customers um, and the next generation of uh, aircraft technicians. Uh, certainly, uh, the hangar uh, helps us build economy of scale, uh, builds our staff base, allows us to invest in additional capabilities to benefit our customers. Um, so as we continue to grow, uh, it just continues to bring uh, benefit to CVG-based um, business. 
And uh, in closing, uh, through our partnership uh, with Epic Flight Academy uh, and the support again of the state and uh, of the airport, we're going to have a joint venture partnership. We're going to build an A&P school uh, in CVG. Uh, we will be able to uh, train technicians to fill this beautiful new hangar uh, and kind of control our own destiny. And um, we'll be able to give uh, scholarships uh, to do that. Uh, so we're really excited about those opportunities. And just in closing, uh, any man or woman who has any interest in aviation, we invite you to come and be a part of a phenomenal industry and the FEME team in Cincinnati. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, we want to thank Wayne Sisson and FEME Aero again. What a great company, worldwide presence, largest operation in Kentucky. Again, really exciting, but showing not just where our economy is, but where it's going. Next, we have G&J Pepsi Cola Bottling Incorporated. G&J is the largest family-owned and operated Pepsi franchise bottler, already employs 371 Kentuckians across two locations in the Commonwealth. G&J will be expanding its operations with a new facility in Maysville, creating 73 jobs with at least 45 of those positions going to Kentuckians. Paying an hourly wage, this is a great day for good jobs, of $29.84, including benefits. G&J has shown its commitment and its belief in our workforce and providing quality, well-paying jobs for Kentuckians. The $8.9 million investment will include a new 124,000 square foot warehouse in Mason County. The new location will allow G&J to run 12 routes daily and help facilitate 4.5 million cases of beverages across both Kentucky and Ohio. Continued investment in distributions and logistics companies like G&J remind us of what we already know. We are in the perfect geographic location to help companies reach uh, the major portion of the U.S. population in a one-day drive. So I want to thank G&J for their continued support of our state's workforce and our economy, as well as local officials in Mason County who are doing a wonderful job. Next, I want to highlight Bardstown Bourbon Company. The Bardstown Bourbon Company is one of America's largest new distilleries and started commercial production in September of 2016. They currently employ 150 Kentucky residents. Last week, we announced Bardstown Bourbon will be growing its operation in Nelson County with a 15,000 square foot expansion, creating 29 full-time, again, great pay and jobs. These positions pay an hourly wage of $38.08, including benefits. The $28.7 million expansion will grow the facility to over 390,000 square feet and it'll add 16 new fermenters along with other improvements. The upgrades will increase the operation's annual capacity by approximately 55,000 barrels. The bourbon and spirits industry remains one of Kentucky's most prominent sectors because of companies like this. They continue to reinvest not only in themselves, but in us. So thank you to Bardstown Bourbon and everyone involved. And our final economic development announcement today is another great bourbon announcement, this one in Bracken County. Yesterday, we announced Augusta Distillery's plans to expand in the Commonwealth. The company's new operation in Bracken County includes a $23 million investment that will generate 14 good jobs for Kentuckians. This will be Augusta Distillery's first full-scale operation in Kentucky and will locate an existing 40,000-square-foot building, formerly home to F.A. Nieder Company, on 1.8 acres. The expansion will include not just a distillery, but a guest experience and an event center, too, that will continue to attract people to the Commonwealth, and I think we all know the stories of people who come, see the amazing parts of Team Kentucky, and stay to live and work here. Construction is anticipated to begin this summer, with the facility being operational by 2024. Augusta Distillery's expansion is a testament to the men and women who help make this state what it is, an increasingly attractive option for business to thrive in a surging economy. Uh, thank you to Augusta Distillery. All right, next up on the agenda. I'm going to be taking some action and signing several pieces of legislation recently passed in the General Assembly. We only have a certain amount of time today, so these are going to be some select pieces of legislation. I think you'll see a number of others likely signed tomorrow. First, I want to begin with House Bill 525, sponsored by Representative Kim Moser, who is with us today. 
The bill codifies into law an existing program administered by the Department for Medicaid Services that requires Medicaid reimbursement for certain services provided by certified community health workers. According to the American Medical Association, these workers, quote, contributed substantially to the improvements in care team productivity and outcome for patients. And the association found that adding these workers to a patient's care actually reduced our health care costs, with the hospital saving $2.30 for every $1 it invested. That's a rate of return most of us would take. In fact, a study found that after adding community health workers to patient-centered medical home uh, ER visits fell by 5%, and with the cost of, of ER visits, that is really significant. Hospitalizations dropped by 12.6% after everything we've been through. We know if people don't need to be in the hospital, we want to make sure that we can prevent that. And that was among patients with diabetes and other chronic health problems. There's also a net savings of $1,135 per patient and a net savings of more than $170,000 annually generated by each of the workers that we're talking about. Our community health workers are amazing, and they are helping us to improve the overall health of the Commonwealth, which results in not only healthier people, but also cost savings. So I'm going to be pleased to sign HB 525, but Representative Moser, if you'd like to say a few words and then join me at the table. Well, thank you very much, Governor. And um, I'm just very excited to be here with you all today. This has been a work in progress for about two years. And I think it's probably one of the more important pieces of healthcare legislation that we've been able to pass. So I just appreciate the opportunity to uh, have, have a few moments with you. Um, I, I also want to take a moment to thank some healthcare organizations and some advocates across our state. Uh, like the Kentucky Home Place, uh, Kentucky Voices for Health has been very instrumental, NAMI and, and others. So uh, thanks to everyone who helped draft this legislation and really worked through the process. Now, this legislation will provide, as the governor said, a network of community health workers, a system of navigation that really helps people access the health care um, that they have um, access to, but aren't for some reason or another actually getting the health care that they need. This will improve health care outcomes across Kentucky. We know that having health insurance, whether it's Medicaid or private coverage, don't, doesn't always equate to getting the preventative care or the care for the chronic management of health conditions that people need. And um, it, as the governor also said, it keeps people out of the emergency room and out of those lengthy, costly health um, or hospitalizations and even prevents premature death. We know that there are many reasons why people don't access the health care that they, that they may need. Um, those may be transportation problems, fear of a bad diagnosis, inability to understand their insurance plan, co-pays, or how to manage their chronic condition. These local certified health professionals work in our medically underserved areas, our communities, and connect individuals with social services and the health care that they need. Community health workers also address the health disparities that we hear so much about. They work in rural areas, clinics, primary care offices, community mental health centers, FQHCs, dental offices, and you name it, they can be embedded in these uh, very important services. Community health workers will now be a Medicaid reimbursable service, and it really targets those Medicaid dollars on a program that we know works. Community health workers are those healthcare workers who make a very big difference in the lives of people connecting individuals with the health care that they need to live healthy and productive lives. I, once again, just want to thank Governor Bashir for supporting this important legislation and certainly for signing it into law. All right. You ready? Yes. All right. 525. Mm -hmm. And there's the seventh.
Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Next up is House Bill 564, which ensures the expansion of voting options passed by the General Assembly in a bipartisan fashion last year continues as intended. Last year, while other states were restricting voting, Kentucky expanded, adding early voting days. This bill requires that early in-person voting is available for at least eight hours between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. on the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday prior to an election. That ensures that those extra days are real with normal hours where people can vote. This bill won bipartisan support in the General Assembly, supported by the State Board of Elections, and continues to work from the last session to make voting easier for Kentuckians. In fact, Kentucky was one of the few states, again, last year and continuing this year, that believes that we can work together to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to vote. So I'm proud to support and sign House Bill 564. We have Representative Josh Branscom to please join us, make a few comments, and we'll sign it into law. Welcome. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor, and honored to be here on this very special day as House Bill 564 is officially signed into law. House Bill 564 is the result of months of hard work going back to last June. And this critical piece of legislation uh, was the product of bipartisan input and the commitment to improving the accessibility for voters to cast their ballots while increasing the security of our elections. As Kentuckians, we're very fortunate to have safe and secure elections. While there is still work to be done, we've taken great strides to ensure they're conducted in a safe, secure, and honest manner. This is due to the diligence of our election officials across the Commonwealth and the passage of legislation such as House Bill 564 by the General Assembly. We will never stop in continuing to build upon the work that we've done over the past few years as we advance towards our goal of becoming the leader in election integrity and security. Governor, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank some of my colleagues from both sides of the aisle who played an essential role in bringing this legislation to fruition. I wanna thank my, my primary co-sponsor, Representative Decker. I also wanna thank Representative Tipton, Representative Tate, Representative Rachel Roberts, and Representative Bratcher for their contributions to the bill as well. And I also wanna take a quick moment to recognize our county clerks and the leadership of the County Clerks Association, the State Board of Elections, and the Secretary of State's Office for being, for being involved in helping to craft this legislation from day one, and I appreciate their invaluable input. Their feedback was vital, and it was important that we were able to accomplish our goals with this bill without hindering them from the undertaking of conducting our elections. They are boots on the ground during election day, and we're very grateful for everything that they do. So once again, thank you to everyone who was involved in this bill. And Governor, I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation to be here today for its signing. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for your work. Thank you. That bill's now headed to the Secretary of State's office, and I would echo, um, while not included in, in my comments, Secretary of State Michael Adams has been um, a good bipartisan uh, partner to this administration, worked well with everyone. Uh, next, I'm going to sign Senate Bill 10. That's sponsored by Robbie Mills. Unfortunately, the senator's traveling today and is unable to be with us. Like other states, Kentucky is working hard to attract and retain more nurses. We have a nursing shortage that has not only impacted our ability to help take care of patients during COVID, but is going to impact our ability to provide important health care services moving forward if we do not address. Uh, I, in, in the last, what, six months, have declared a state of emergency in this area and was already making a number of the changes that we see in Senate Bill 10. Senate Bill 10 helps uh, aims to help post-secondary education colleges and universities that face barriers in expanding 
their nursing programs. We need to be training more nurses. We need to make sure that unnecessary bureaucracy is not getting in the way, while at the same time, uh, we ensure the quality standards that are so important. This bill addresses key issues in our nursing pipeline and aims to eliminate some of the barriers that nurses face when practicing or attempting to practice in Kentucky. It'll help us improve the process for out-of-state trained nurses to come in and to be practicing in Kentucky sooner. And it makes changes to the Kentucky Board of Nursing, limiting board members to three consecutive terms and increasing representation by nurses themselves. So I'm proud to sign Senate Bill 10 and support our nursing programs and nurses here in Kentucky. All right, the next one, I think we got a couple people here uh, to support and very excited to see them. We've got a whole group of kids and, and parents that are here for, I think, something that's pretty special to them. Today, I'm proud to sign Senate Bill 105, which will help newborns, our children, mothers, and our families by increasing awareness and screenings for CMV. This is a virus that can cause childhood deafness and other health challenges, but Unfortunately, most CMV infections are not diagnosed without newborn screening, resulting in missed opportunity for needed care. This bill was sponsored by Senator Max Wise, who is traveling and unable to be with us today. In attendance is our very own Virginia Moore, who's actually signing in the back for all the families that are here. You can't stop working, can you? She is no stranger to this room, and it's wonderful to see you helping us communicate with everybody in person in this room once again. Additionally, we have um, Sarah Roof, Dr. Shelley Motes, and Kathy Lester, and most importantly, two families impacted by CMV. First, we have Katie Bentley and Meg and June Bowden. We also have Sarah Strevel. Sarah's the mother of Bella, who was inspired by this bill and unfortunately um, passed away, uh, I think a year ago today, two years ago today. So. I know a very emotional moment for this family, but I hope you know we love you and hope this bill can honor um, Bella in some way. So Sarah, I'm proud that we can take action in Bella's honor. Would you like to join us and maybe offer a few words? And as she's doing that, everybody else who wants to be a part of the signing, families, everybody else, come on up. Thank you hey, so much. Thank you. So two years ago today, I held my baby girl for the last time. I held her as she struggled to take her last breath. Two years ago today, I held my breath, waiting to see if there would be another. Two years ago today, I had to head my baby over to a corner. Two years ago today, was the first night in three years that I hadn't slept with her on my chest. My world ended two years ago today. Little did I know there would be all new doors that would open. On March the 15th, 2002, I got a message from a dear friend who wanted to know if I was ready to change the world. Little did I know how literal those words were going to be. Sarah Roof, the executive director of Hands and Voices, set me out on a mission and together with her, a host of other professionals and families, we had no way of knowing just how big this was gonna get. For the last two years, we've collected research, we've collected data, we've gathered families, and we've rallied all the professionals. We've pled our case before the Senate, and then in the interim, and then the House. We've hosted webinars, we've raised 
awareness and education. Bella's bill was passed through the House on March the 30th, two years from the month that we began. Bella's law unfortunately doesn't change anything for our sweet Bella or any of the other CMV families. But it just may be that her spirit will be living on inside of other little ones who are affected by this law. Bella Dawn truly is changing the world. I want to thank everyone that has had a part in helping us to pass this law. Thank you, Thank you. so much. All right, we'll sign it over here if we want to flip around. Yeah. Hold on. Are you Bella's brother? Yes. Hey, I'm Andy. Yeah. I'm, I'm real sorry. Yeah. Will you sit next to me while I sign this? Would you do that? How about, how about standing right here? Yeah. Why don't you pick, why don't you pick which pen? Yeah. That one? All right. Will you take this after I do it? Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is the actual bill, right? So you sign this and then take it over and it becomes small. Right then, right there. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? For each family, we've got enough. We don't do anything. Thank you. 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 Thank you want to say anything? Come on up. You have to. Come on. Come on. And we can't be in this room and have Virginia Moore without turning it over to her. <laughs> um, the fight came from the families, the issue to make change. I think we all have that in us. We can make change. It happens, and it's so important. CMB is something that we need to educate all doctors about. And I think with this bill, we can do that. Hearing loss is a huge issue for so many families and so many people today. We just keep, need to keep moving forward to educate everybody on what it is. And uh, I want to thank the governor for his, his generosity in opening the doors for access and allowing all of us to be here today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you to everybody who participated in that, um, especially um, Bella's mom, dad, and, and brother. I know a, a moment that both tough and um, hopefully meaningful. And we appreciate you being here and, I mean, truly showing the importance of this to the entire Commonwealth. All right, next is House Bill 494. It's sponsored by Representative Deanna Frazier Gordon, and it provides regulatory oversight of student education loan servicing industry here in Kentucky for the first time. Student education loan servicing has become a significant issue with billions of dollars in outstanding debt nationwide. About 600,000 Kentuckians have outstanding student loans until this year. My family was one of them. This legislation empowers the Department of Financial Institutions, or DFI, with the tools to protect consumers here before harm occurs. Under this bill's provisions, DFI will be able to address unlicensed activity and prohibit deceptive acts and practices. We've talked about protecting our youngest ones by the last bill we talked about. This is protecting our students. It also provides for enhanced penalties for any violations. 
involving the military, public servants, and older borrowers. And it spells out the requirements for change to service and complaint resolution protocols. HB 494 will protect Kentucky's residents as they seek to improve their lives through education. Representative Deanna Frazier Gordon, unfortunately could not be with us, but we're proud to have Representative Patty Mentor, who has worked hard for this legislation. Patty, if you wanna make a few comments, if you'd like to join us then at the table. Thank you so much, Governor Bashir. We're here today to take a much needed step toward protecting student loan borrowers here in Kentucky. Students are taking on more loan debt than ever before just so they can afford a college degree. The students I hear from in my classroom or in my office at Western Kentucky University are worried about their future. And I've heard from so many constituents in District 20 who are stuck with massive loan debt and they wonder if the degree they earned was worth that indebtedness. Addressing the student loan crisis requires national solutions, and I applaud President Biden for once again extending the pause on federal student loan payments just two days ago. But here in Kentucky, we're taking a first step, and that is absolutely something worth celebrating. I'm proud to be co-sponsor of House Bill 494, which incorporates ideas I first introduced as part of the Student Loan Borrowers Bill of Rights. These are long overdue ideas, such as requiring careful oversight of student loan servicers and cracking down on predatory practices. While there is still more work to do to make paying for college as safe, affordable, and transparent as possible, this bipartisan bill, which passed both houses unanimously, is a crucial and important milestone in our work to protect each and every borrower. As a college professor, as a representative from a college town, and as the mother of a child who goes to college in a few years, I'm deeply grateful to be part of this milestone today. Thank you to the General Assembly for passing this unanimously, and thank you, Governor Bashir, for signing this much needed bill into law today. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes. I think Representative Mentor was being modest. Her son, Alex, is absolutely brilliant. And uh, I'm sure there will be scholarships in his future. Um, he is a neat kid. You all are great parents. Um, as I close uh, in bills that we are signing today, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there are two days left. Kentuckians deserve the passage of a medical marijuana bill. They overwhelmingly support it. When 70 plus percent of a state is in favor of something, it's time for the General Assembly to step up and do something about it. Represent the people. It's also time for sports betting to pass. You can drive across virtually every border in Kentucky and place a bet on your phone. It's time for Kentucky not to be last and to step up and to join the rest of the world. Now, let's move to a veto that I'm going to sign today. My administration has always been an education first administration. I'm a proud Kentucky public school graduate and I owe a debt of gratitude to my teachers that I may never be able to fully explain. Without their investment and their care, without the education services they provided, without sparking the, the creativity, the desire to, to learn more without teaching how to work hard and study to do all of the work that's necessary to get a job done. I don't know if I'd be where I am today. I certainly know I wouldn't be who I am today. And I can think of about eight different names as I think back on my time, either at Henry Clay High School or, or Morton Middle School or Cassidy Elementary School about how much uh, these folks selflessly 
underpaid did for me. So I deeply and I personally believe that we should be investing in our public schools and our educators. And I provided a budget proposal that did just that, that actually met the moment that we are in. It would have propelled us not just to a top 10 economy, but beyond an opportunity to have the best public education system in America. It would have provided over $2 billion of additional funding, not through K through 12, but pre-K through 12, with every Kentucky kid being kindergarten ready and nobody being left out in the beginning. It also recognized our educators. Our budget provides a raise, a wonderful raise, and it's going to, to our state workers. They need it. A wonderful raise to law enforcement virtually throughout the state. They need it. But our educators deserve one, too, and they shouldn't be the ones left out. That's why my budget proposal required a 5% salary increase for all school personnel, and we provided plenty of money to be able to do that and so much more. The General Assembly refused. It was right there. The dollars were there. It was a refusal. Voting against raises for educators and now voting to take tax dollars away from our public schools. This is wrong, and it's why today I'm vetoing House Bill 9 in its entirety. I'm against charter schools. They are wrong for our Commonwealth. They take taxpayer dollars away from the already underfunded public schools in the Commonwealth. And our taxpayer dollars should not be redirected to for-profit entities that run charter schools. As Attorney General, I can tell you the number of prosecutions we had against for-profit colleges, how so many of them took advantage of so many people, and the idea that we would open up that same ability for people to prey on our even younger students is simply not the direction Kentucky should go. And the bill would send taxpayer dollars to charter schools that have boards that are not elected and are not answerable to the people, public dollars being spent without that oversight. And they're not even required to comply with the same controls and accountability measures as our public schools. The answer to concerns about the performance in our public schools lies with actually funding and working with our public schools, not trying to divert money away to folks that you give more flexibility to than the group you're asking to do a better job. And House Bill 9 is unconstitutional, and I believe that it will be found that way by courts if this veto is overridden. Kentucky's Constitution makes it clear the General Assembly shall, by appropriate legislation, provide for an efficient system of common schools throughout the state. Common schools are public schools, and public taxpayer dollars, I believe, under the Constitution can only go to public schools. This is a constitutional mandate, and the Kentucky Supreme Court has upheld this language in our Constitution time and time again. The, quote, the sole responsibility for providing the system of common schools is that of our General Assembly, end quote. And with House Bill 9, the General Assembly is abdicating that responsibility, and I believe violating that oath that we all take to not just the U.S., but the Kentucky Constitution. House Bill 9 also improperly and unconstitutionally targets Jefferson County and Northern Kentucky, requiring them to authorize charter schools within a certain time frame. Picking out one or two areas is exactly how the last bill got declared unconstitutional and why the injunction is still in place. For those reasons, but mainly for my belief in our public schools and my gratitude for what they did for me and how I believe that yes, we can do better, but only if we provide them the tools our public schools and their employees, they are not enemies of the legislature. They are heroes of the people. Virtually every legislator has their kids in a public school that is doing the very best for them. It's time we do the very best for those public schools. So with that, I'm going to veto House Bill 9. A veto message. This pen goes to our Lieutenant Governor, our former public school educator. Yes, 
All right. Um, next up, uh, we've got Dr. Stack with us here today. It's been a couple of weeks since we have had a COVID update. There is a lot out there in the news between other boosters, uh, this new variant. What I can say is that almost all of our map is green. And I know for Dr. Stack and myself, how good does it feel to be here? And we continue to see declines. Again, the pandemic isn't over and living with the pandemic is not ignoring it. Dr. Stack, wow, we've got me, you, and Virginia here in person today. Oh, it's been a while. <laughs> nice to see you. You too, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. And it is good to be green. It's nice to see a map that looks like that. And this map is different than the map we used to use. The map we used to use talked about how much the disease was spreading. This one blends together the spread of the disease, but also healthcare capacity. So I think this map is an improvement over the one we had before. And it's good to see that it's green with all those considerations. Uh, 114 counties are green, six are yellow. Um, and again, let's hope it stays that way. A little update nationwide, uh, Omicron is pretty much all the virus that's in the United States. About 72% uh, of it nationally is BA2, that's the newer version of Omicron. 25% is BA1. In our region, region four, which Kentucky's a part, it's about 60% BA2 and 40% BA1. We lag just a little bit. We will stay vigilant at the Kentucky Department for Public Health and with uh, Governor Bashir and monitoring developments here in the state, uh, nationally and worldwide. For the general public though, I strongly recommend you tune out the buzz and the chatter about the variant du jour. It just adds to anxiety and worry about things you can't control anyway. And the way you can control it, we already know, regardless of whatever the variant is, you need to do these things. Keep up to date on your COVID vaccinations, for everyone who's eligible, that means two doses in a primary series plus one booster. If you have severe immune disease, it could be three doses initially plus one booster. Now they have just recently approved a second uh, booster, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. I wanna keep urging people, please support folks who mask up. We've gotta be tolerant and supportive of people who mask up. It means they're protecting themselves or someone they love who may be more vulnerable. It is okay though. And this is important. There's another side to this. It's okay for folks to be out in public now in green counties, of which we had 116 on that screen a minute ago. It is okay to be in places with other people without masks. And you'll see me out, uh, in fact. And so please just be respectful to others, uh, make a risk-based assessment, and please go to KY COVID-19, our website, look for the current map, and underneath there is guidance. If you could just please adjust your behaviors to match the map. <laughs> we can keep ourselves safe and enjoy a lot more of our lives the way we uh, once knew them. To the second booster for the FDA, uh, they approved on March 29th, a second booster. It is a permissive approval, meaning you can get it if you feel you are in need or if your healthcare provider recommends it for you. It's not required at this point in order to be up to date, but anyone 50 or older is eligible. And anyone who is 12 or older, if you're talking about Pfizer or 18 and older, if you're talking Moderna is eligible if you have a substantial immune compromising condition. What I would strongly recommend is if you're thinking about getting a second booster, I'd in encourage you to consult your healthcare provider. If you're older in age, if you're over 65, it's probably a good idea to get one soon because you wanna keep your protection high. But for a lot of other folks, it's a little bit more nuanced now. I'd encourage you to talk to your healthcare professional and get their opinion about what's in your best interest for your health. There's now only one authorized monoclonal antibody. Now remember, these are really good for people who do get sick and are at high risk to help avert their uh, need to go to the hospital or for them getting even more ill. But there's only one that works against the BA2. And so uh, this medication is called uh, Bebtilovimab, or Beb for short. And, and BEB is available in sufficient supply in Kentucky uh, for everyone who needs it. Demand has really decreased for monoclonals now because the disease at the moment is in a very low place. So we're currently giving less than 200 doses or treatments a week each of the last two weeks in Kentucky. That's good. We wanna hopefully keep the disease at this low level. The two oral medications, Molnupiravir, that's the Merck medication, and Paxlovid, that's the Pfizer medication are now available in nearly every Walgreens and most or many uh, CVS's, Kroger's, Walmart's, and we're working to expand to the independent pharmacies. The supplies have not markedly increased, but because the demand is sufficiently low, we've been able to expand its distribution more. Your personal physician 
nurse practitioner or physician assistant can provide it to you or prescribe it to you rather if you are eligible for it. So please consult a healthcare professional if you test positive and feel that one of those medications is necessary for you. And in closing, it's National Public Health Week, uh, April 4 through 11. So I've had uh, the wonderful opportunity as COVID has receded a bit to travel the state over two months or so, I'll be at about 21 of the 61 health departments across the uh, Commonwealth. And I have a goal to make sure by the end of the year, I've reached all 61 health departments in 120 counties across the Commonwealth. These public health professionals in your local health departments are public health heroes and local community heroes. They work very hard on your behalf, not just for COVID, but for hands and first steps in WIC and for preventions for cancers and to support you for uh, uh, reproductive health and a whole variety of other things. I, I hope you'll please, if you know one of them, thank them and wish them well and congratulate them on Public Health Week. And I wanna thank the rest of the public as well. I've had the chance now to be at some restaurants. I've shared over this two year journey. I love going to restaurants, I love traveling. And COVID took that from me too for a while. For everyone who's recognized me and said hello and, and smiled across the way out in public, uh, I just wanna say for two years plus, we've been saying up here, the governor and I, we'll be better together and to be kind and caring for each other. And so many of you have shown that kindness and caring, I wanna thank you. I have never believed more than I do now today that through kindness and caring towards each other and a mutual respect, we can get farther and be better together. So thank you, Team Kentucky. It's great to be here today. And now let's just hope that we can keep it this way. So please keep track of that map and follow the guidance that's associated with it. So thank you very much, Governor. Still important to clean your hands. As I have now coughed and sneezed during the same press conference two years ago, we would have all uh, been nervous. So let's talk about some other um, kindness and caring opportunities. Today, I'm excited to invite Kentuckians to two special events we have coming up, uniting our people in prayer as we enter into this season of hope and renewal. On Wednesday, April 13th, I will be hosting what is, because of COVID, my first Governor's Prayer Breakfast at 7.30 a.m. on the State Capitol's South Lawn. We plan to host this breakfast in March of 2020, but we all know what happened in March of 2020. It was one of the first large events canceled because of COVID-19, but I think that was a testament to our faith about loving and caring about one another and not wanting to expose anyone, especially at a time we had zero treatments, no thoughts of vaccines, and not knowing exactly how to fight this virus. It was the right decision. So this celebration will recognize Kentuckians living through their living their faith through their service to others. We'll get to hear beautiful music from the Ukrainian Pentecostal Church Choir of Lexington and a keynote speech from UK men's basketball star Oscar Sheway, who has won every single Player of the Year honor and is going to be here sharing his faith with, I think, a lot of his teammates and the women's team. Uh, here in support. You can buy a table in advance or purchase individual tickets on the morning of the event as you arrive. It's going to be an incredible morning and we'd love to see as many people out as possible. We've also got some fun for the kids next weekend and we want to use our new green space between the, the Capitol and the Annex in a way that kids can enjoy. So on Saturday, April 16th from 1.30 to 4 p.m., we're hosting a prayer service and then an Easter egg hunt here at the Capitol uh, at the Capitol Terrace. The event is free and it is open to all. You may even see Winnie in bunny ears if she will continue to wear them if she's on her good behavior that day. After such a difficult two years, this celebration is going to mean more and I can't wait to enjoy that holiday uh, with uh, so, mu so much of my family, but also all of our team Kentucky family. So once again, Governor's Prayer Breakfast, 7.30 a.m. Wednesday, April 13th. Easter service and egg hunt will be at 1.30 Saturday, April 16th. They are both on the Capitol grounds. And finally, our Team Kentucky All-Stars. On March 25th, I had the honor of joining the Kentucky State Police for the graduation of 71 candidates from the agency's Basic Training Academy. Cadet Class 101 was the largest KSP Basic Training Academy graduating class since 2014. That is really good news. These 71 men and women combined, committed and succeeded to 24 weeks of some of the most intense training that anyone ever goes through so they can pre be prepared to do the best 
for people in some of the toughest situations and they can keep themselves safe so they can go home to so many of the families I saw and met that day. No matter the emergency facing the Commonwealth, KSP shows up and while all while continuing to answer countless calls for service to assist Kentuckians. That is not a task that should be seen as regular, but should be recognized as extraordinary. So today I say thank you to these 71 new troopers for being our team Kentucky All-Stars. Thank you for answering the call. Thank you for enduring the 24 weeks. Thank you for choosing to serve with the Kentucky State Police. Thank you for being a part of Team Kentucky. Let's all commit to these 71 cadets that working as one state, working together, we can build a better and a safer Kentucky for everyone. So with that, we have a large press contingent today. Uh, we'll try to make sure everybody gets at least one question in. A bunch in person that I have on the list. I think there are probably some that I don't have on the list. We'll get everybody as well as at least three virtually. So in the order that I have them, starting with the person who never misses one of these, Tom Latek. Thank you, Governor. Um, in fact, you enabled me to scratch off one of my questions one of the bills, but there are two hanging out there that I was curious to see uh, when you might be signing or vetoing them. One would be House Bill 3, the abortion bill, and the other would be House Bill 1, the executive branch budget. What's, what's the status on those two? Well, the executive branch budget is a pretty long document, and you have, as governor, line item veto uh, authority there, so that's a little different. Mm -hmm. So what happens with the budget is you go through, you make any line item vetoes, everything else at that point becomes law. And then the legislature looks at the line item vetoes. Now, these can be substantive. They can also correct uh, errors within it. Um, we always have LRC reach out afterwards um, because we all make mistakes in statements or documents. Uh, and, and so we've even had some requests both from the legislature, also from uh, some industry on unforeseen consequences that weren't intended that we're working with people on, as well as uh, uh, potentially some some substantive uh, line items there. Um, overall, the budget has a number of good things in it. Um, it certainly comes up short on education, on meeting the moment for our public schools and our educators. Um, but when we get around to taking action on the budget, I do uh, want to note that it has um, a number of great opportunities in it, um, and also met almost every economic development request that we had, which is gonna mean some uh, so, some good things. It, it really, um, at the end, again, with the exception, and I take exception, uh, to the lack of truly transformational funding for public education, which could have and should have been included uh, in the budget, There, they, you, you could tell that there was collaboration, not just between the two chambers of the legislative branch, but really looking at the executive branch budget as well. Melissa Patrick. Oh, hi. Um, is, yeah, are second. we truly in an, an endemic phase of this pandemic? Are, and, and I'm also curious, you know, on this side of it, what are our health departments asking for at this point? Uh, so, so, so both are we in an endemic phase? We, we'll only know uh, when we don't see uh, surges like we have seen in the past. And I think it's going to take some time to know that's the case. It'll certainly be a good sign if, if you know, too, if this new version of, of uh, Omicron uh, does not cause uh, a spike here in the United States. But as we look at things going on overseas, it's too early. I think we are learning to live at the moment with a pandemic that is thankfully at a very low level. And we all hope it's already become endemic. We just won't know about it yet uh, or, or until there's sufficient time to to be secure, and and that's where we are. Our local health departments, in some instances, are are asking for a little more flexibility to do some of the great work that they did before uh, COVID. Uh, certainly, uh, here uh, we're going to move from likely regular testing with the Franklin County Health Department, who I think I know all of them by name. They've been wonderful to us here in the capital as well as the community, to likely using home-based testing, and that's that's a big change. Um, remember, our health departments, and and you know this. Uh, do so much work. And there's so many other uh, health factors and, and conditions and prevention uh, that we have to be addressing. And my hope is we're moving to a place where they can focus more of their time on that. Uh, Karen Zarr. Thank you, Governor. Could you elaborate on, on your decision to veto uh, Senate Bills 1 and 83? 
the transgender and, uh, and putting people in public more in charge of school districts and critical race theory. So Senate Bill 83 uh, removes parents from having a direct voice in who the principal is of their school and in their curriculum. I have seen over the last year um, a number of legislators voice that parents should have as much say as possible in their children's education or decisions related to it, removes them entirely. You know, right now it's the councils that include both parents and teachers that heavily weigh in on principles. So if you believe a parent should be actively involved in education, uh, this legislature just took your voice away. Same as in curriculum. It's not being decided in an open school board meeting where uh, people can come in, even though now, you know, there's that opportunity. They wanted more time for people to be able to make public comments, but they're moving those decisions more and more uh, to, to the superintendent. And that leaves out parents. And I am the parent of kids in our public schools. And I believe that I should have a say on all of that. And I believe a superintendent who's leading correctly can work with information, can work with parents on finding the best, but this bill um, excludes them, reduces parental voice, and I think that's wrong. It also um, isn't one that that removes a specific curriculum, right? The, 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 the national debate is about a specific set curriculum. And what the General Assembly didn't do is come in and say this curriculum published by this group which isn't taught anywhere in Kentucky, can't be taught in Kentucky. What it did is instead say, you have to teach about these topics in this way. These have to be the words coming out of your mouth. And then tried to establish what the most important documents in U.S. history are. And they put a speech against a, yeah, uh, from a, yes, a later president, but it was a political speech in favor of a presidential candidate that lost by the largest margin in U.S. history in with the Declaration of Independence. And it's in part a speech by, at that time, a partisan candidate. To put that above Dwight Eisenhower's message to the troops on D-Day is meaning we're not trying to put history forward, we're pushing politics. And I think that's wrong. And we've gotta have safe spaces for our kids to have conversations. If they're not gonna do it with adults, they're gonna do it without adults. Uh, and the idea that we would come in and police if one of those conversations doesn't go exactly how we want it to is not what America's about. Uh, First Amendment is critically important. And just imagine a teacher's got to respond to some comments made in the classroom as well. Uh, it, it, we can't put them in that uh, position. All right. On, on, on the transgender sports bill. First. You will not find one example, not one, of a competitive advantage by a transgender athlete in Kentucky. You will not find one. The reason is KHSAA was ahead of its time and has already implemented very stringent uh, standards and rules that prevent it. I mean, the rules actually say they prevent it. They say that an athlete either has to transition before they reach puberty, where you don't have then that hormonal potential ad ad advantage, or you have to go through uh, hormonal therapy for enough time to where there is not a competitive advantage. It's directly written in. So KHSAA has already very strictly prevented the thing that people are trying to get other folks riled up about. There cannot be an athlete with an uncompetitive advantage in Kentucky under the current rules. So what then does this do? I worry that it makes kids that are already struggling feel worse about themselves. Listen, I remember middle school. Middle school was hard. I have kids in middle school. It's hard on them. Now imagine middle school with social media. Now imagine middle school being a child who is trans, who's probably either not on a sports team or certainly not playing it for anything other than meeting other kids and trying to be just accepted as a human being. Listen, I love sports. I love watching them. But my faith calls me to put compassion and care for my fellow human being above anything else. You know, I think about one of my favorite stories in the Bible where, you know, at the time, people would keep kids away from major religious leaders or, or government figures, right? And, and Jesus turns to his apostles and he says, let the kids come to me and do not hinder them. He didn't read in any exceptions. 
none. And this is something that governors of Indiana and Utah have done. So anybody claiming that somebody's being driven by any woke this or that. Well, first of all, I read that to my wife and she laughed out loud and said, do they know you still try to wear a suit you bought 20 years ago? And, and we're just trying to do the right thing. I think people by now, through everything we've been through, through everything we've said at this podium, knows that I'm not driven by any base. I'm driven by what I believe is right. And here, I'm trying to put what I believe is a calling to always come at things with the, the greatest of care and compassion for our individuals, especially uh, our youth first. All right, Bodie. Well, any veto that the legislature overrides is ultimately on their conscience, as is the impacts that, that it could make. You know, defunding our public schools isn't good for anybody. And we've got to know that while there might be some children in charter schools, if it, if it passes, most are going to be in public schools. So you're taking dollars away from the institutions that, that, that educate most of our kids. And in a state where the KHSAA has already prevented any uncompetitive advantage, it just seems mean, right? It just seems mean. And we ought to be better than that. Uh, Gil McClanahan, welcome to Frankfurt. Well, thank you. I figured that uh, um, we'd, be, we'd appreciate the presence. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I wanted to ask you another question on uh, Senate Bill 1. Um, you said in your veto message that it lessens parents' role in education, and I've read over the bill. Maybe I missed it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know, but um, I don't find that in the bill. What I do find is parents mentioned a lot in the bill. In fact, you know, councils created, uh, you know, to have parents on this. So. What are you facing? That it takes sure. S Senate Bill 1 gives almost full authority to a superintendent, maybe with some say, uh, to select both uh, principals. Uh, and they even say that out loud, uh, that the superintendent is going to select the principal, as well as um, more, more uh, control over curriculum. Right now, the site-based decision-making councils have significant, um, not just say, but an actual role in selection of principals. Parents are on that. That's a big part of it. And so you're removing parents from having an actual vote to maybe just being able to express their voice. It's definitely taking parents out of the actual decision making. And when legislators look at you and say, we're gonna give superintendents the ultimate control they don't have right now, that's coming away uh, from parents. On the curriculum, you are ha now having a required portion of Kentucky curriculum through this bill. Before that was decided by a board of education with direct input from parents at the meeting and any portion that a site-based decision-making council would have in it. Now, there are specific requirements. Yes, there's chance for input outside of that, but as a parent, I don't agree that Reagan's speech before he was president is more important than Eisenhower's D-Day statement. I was just at the World War II Museum in New Orleans and thinking about that being one of the critical moments in our history. That message on a day that preserved our democracy, uh, that preserved the free world, is pretty important. And if we're going to start putting lists out about the most important documents or speeches, certainly putting a political one ahead of it's wrong. I have a follow up too, if I, if I could. Um, along those same lines with these, uh, with these historical documents and speeches, um, I take from the bill that uh, they, they want uh, this stuff being taught in middle and high school, I mean, I certainly understand your point, but what is so wrong with a middle or a high school person learning the Gettysburg Address again, learning the Constitution? Well, certainly any middle and high schooler is going to learn the Gettysburg Address and the Constitution. But once you start picking other documents and putting them on their level, you're going well beyond suggestions. And you're going for requirements in education. And what does it mean when you start putting political speeches? Right. That's not the Gettysburg Address. 
That's not the Constitution or the Declaration. What you start getting into is pushing your politics through it, and that should never happen, right, in, in, in curriculum. And I know people worry that, that politics is pushed into curriculum from other directions. Let's take it all out. You know, if we're going to say uh, teach the most important documents in history, let's have historians choose them, right, and, and, and not, a, not a political body. All right, uh, Chelsea Jones. Do we have Chelsea? Yeah, there you go. Um, Governor, you just signed into law House Bill 564. Do you believe that it goes far enough in ensuring uh, the right to vote, especially as we head into the midterms this fall? So 564 um, does help in the expansion of voting access in Kentucky. You know, last year, while other states were restricting days, hours, times, Kentucky added three days of early voting. What they didn't say is what hours they had to be in. And so there could have been the possibility at local levels of having hours that don't really mean there was an extra day. So this ensures that that expansion is real. Uh, and I believe will mean there are more hours in those three days than we otherwise would have seen. Does it go far enough? Absolutely not. All right, we, we saw in the midst of the pandemic that you can run a secure election with, uh, with, with no excuse absentee voting, which is voting by mail. We had a huge turnout. It, it didn't um, create any different makeup in, in party and the amount of voting. All it did is mean more people participated in voting. I believe democracy is, the, is voting is the bedrock of democracy. And we have already proven that if you give people more options and you just spend time making their, them secure, that more people participate. So it's a good bill. It does add some expansions, not even close to where we should be. But listen, we're moving the right direction when other people aren't. So I'll live in the world of the possible, celebrate what the bill does, and hope we will do more. Uh, Joe, produce. Uh, I know we've talked about a lot of specific education bills that you vetoed, but uh, kind of in a broad sense with all of the bills that have hit your desk over the last uh, week or so, uh, and including the budget, too, which includes phrases from the seed funding formula that I know Republicans What's your take on where legislative priorities are in regards to education? You know, I believe when you look at legislative priorities in terms of education, yes, a little bit more money was added, but look at how much more we had, right? When you have more than $1.9 billion more in general fund than you did the year before, what your priorities are aren't that you put some extra money into something. It's how much did you use from what you had? Right. That's that's how much you value anything. Right. If you have a pie. Right. And, and you divide it up with your priorities. Where do you put the majority of it? It's not in K through 12 public education. I do believe the higher education budget is much better. Uh, I believe that we saw funding increases. I do worry that part of those increases are done in in ways um, that are to the detriment of some of our regional universities. Uh, certainly there was uh, uh, an asset preservation fund that was necessary and there are some projects in it. But K through 12 doesn't meet the moment. And not doing pre-K I think is inexcusable. It's only 170, what, $174 million, 1.9 billion. And if you're gonna complain about the workforce and try to slash benefits, at least do the one thing that's been proven to add the most people to the workforce the fastest, which is universal pre-K. Uh, let's see, Austin. Yeah, I'm wondering about uh, a few of the bills that you vetoed to give the governor powers. Mm -hmm. um, you called some of them unconstitutional. Can you just elaborate that? And also, why do you think this has been a priority of this general assembly? Yeah, so since I became, wait, since the governor's office shifted in party, uh, the legislature has repeatedly stripped powers from the executive branch that have been there forever. And a lot of people would say it's about party. It's more about power. It's about the legislature trying to take more power from both the executive branch and they've tried from the courts in a couple of bills this time. And our constitution was set up with three branches of government because this was expected, right? That the that, that three branches of government were created so power wasn't consolidated in one. But if you look at our constitution, which creates the strictest separation of powers really in the country, and was meant to be interpreted that way, though there have been a couple of decisions recently that didn't interpret it that way. Um, our our uh, drafters of the most recent constitution had seen different branches try to become the dominant 
branch. And what you see when that happens, when people don't feel like they're answerable to anybody, including another branch, is you see uh, um, meanness and vindictiveness. Uh, and, and we cannot allow you know, that to happen. Now, the, the legislature will claim that they are a policy branch. Okay, but why are they trying to take over operations of different things? Uh, so it's my job, not just as governor right now, serving right now, but to future uh, chief executives to ensure what is supposed to be in the executive branch stays in the executive branch. And one part of that is appointments to, to various boards. So the governor is the only constitutional officer that the Constitution vests with faithfully executing the law. And so if you take away parts of the executive branch from the governor, or having a majority of appointments on something, you no longer have the ability, you no longer have the constitutional requirement for that entity to faithfully execute the law. And that's a big problem, right? That's what the executive branch is supposed to do. But only the governor is vested with that authority because it's expected that outside the other constitutional officers, uh, the other groups are ultimately answerable to the governor who is answerable to the people. So that is my constitutional uh, law discussion of the day. All right, who do we miss? Yeah. Hey, not on my list. Okay. How do you feel about the lack of zero bonuses coming out of your budget? I believe this legislature needs to spend some of the last two days, including hero bonuses. My goodness. We look at the last two years, especially the scariest moments in the beginning where we were asking people to continue to go to work. When the virus in the beginning, I mean, had, had almost a 10% mortality rate in some places, we didn't have treatments, uh, and you could bring it home to your family and put them at risk. They deserve those hero bonuses. Now, in, in my review of the budget, I can only line item things out. I can't add things in. And so I believe that every uh, nurse, every utility worker, every law enforcement officer, every first responder, uh, those that, that went to, to, to factories and distribution centers like uh, UPS that, that helped distribute vaccines worldwide deserve uh, that bonus. But I think the leadership of the General Assembly disagrees. I think it's really disappointing. All right? Yeah. Are there any vetoed bills that you have uh, circled that um, if it does, if the Republicans do override it, that you plan to take it to court. I know you touched on HB 9 a little bit. Are right. So whether or not we would take something to court uh, likely depends on you know whether it directly impacts uh, the authority of the executive branch because we're the only party that can. Right. So what when when you go to court, there's supposed to be an impact to the party that that files the lawsuit, and it's certainly unconstitutional to tell the governor that he can't take something to court, which they've tried to do. You're the only person charged with faithfully executing the law, and you can't challenge an unconstitutional law. Right? That's not only a problem, that's a, that's a dereliction of duty and a violation of the oath of office to, to try to uh, restrict. Now, there are a lot of these other bills, there are natural groups out there that are not me and are, are probably are not a branch of government that I fully expect to, to challenge. Things they're trying to do to Louisville and Jefferson County, right? They are the, the proper plaintiff. Uh, things that they may be trying to do to public schools, those are public school groups that are likely in the best position to do that. Uh, but I expect based on the vetoes I've signed, for there to be significant legislation uh, having no involvement from me. All right, um, we've got three on the phone. Debbie Yetter. Hi, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask about your intentions on a, on a couple of bills. One is House Bill 3, the Omnibus Abortion Bill, and also 7, the Public Benefit Bill. And also, do you have any thoughts about uh, 690, the bill that was amended to let lawyers take guns into the courthouse? So on 690 right now, I am uh, receiving communications from FOP, from Sheriff's Association, from prosecutors and others. Uh, I'm reviewing that. Uh, I wanna make sure that uh, our law enforcement and our court workers are safe. And so I want to listen uh, to the concerns and then we'll, we'll ultimately act uh, from there. Uh, the two others uh, I am reviewing, uh, certainly on seven, uh, there are real concerns about loss of federal funding and the amount of money it would take to implement with absolutely no funding provided for it. On uh, three, you know, still reviewing it, um, 
certainly concerns uh, that situations you see as a prosecutor, 12, 13 year old girl raped, impregnated by a family member, an uncle, sometimes even a father, that happens, it shouldn't, uh, but it happens. Uh, they deserve options. Uh, more than a little concern, House Bill 3 would give them none. In fact, might require that victim to go to the actual perpetrator to ask if they can have options. I think the vast majority of Kentuckians think that's wrong. Uh, Bria Jones, WFPL. Hi, Governor. Can you give an idea of when maybe we'll, like, we'll know about your decisions on those bills that you're still reviewing? Um, I know you still have some time left, but just an idea on like maybe when we'll start to hear some more things about that. And then also this might be more for Dr. Stack, but is there an idea of the last time that we saw numbers for COVID this low in the Commonwealth? Um, just to get an idea of like when the last time we had numbers this, this low for us. We'll get you an answer on that. The stair stepper chart, when you look at it, is again lower than the previous week. I believe we're down uh, to last summer. Certainly, the positivity rate is below two percent. Uh, so we are at a very good place, especially when you look at the map uh, and what that looks like. Uh, the General Assembly passed more than a hundred bills in a day at the end of this session. Uh, my duty is to read them because there's no way when they're not announced before a committee, when there are full committee substitutes, when people are required to vote on a committee substitute that changes every word that was just put in front of them, and then it's brought to the floor on the same day and voted on, that even the majority of legislators have read it. So I'm taking my time within the time that I have uh, to take uh, the, the, the right actions. We're, we're gonna make sure, again, that we get through them. For instance, on 690, um, most legislators that we've talked to had no idea about the amendment tacked on. And that's the danger, right? This is supposed to be a deliberative body that reads everything and that takes time in the decisions that they make. That's why there's supposed to be three readings on three separate days, open committee hearings, open dialogue, questions that people answer, um, really concerned about where the process has gone, and then different proposals to further limit the type of records that you can get from the legislative branch that you can get from the executive branch. And finally, the lack of fiscal notes on so many of these bills, which used to be an absolute requirement, know what it's going to cost before you pass it, because if it's going to cost something, you should have to appropriate for it. Uh, Corinne Boyer with our last question, WEKU. Hi, Governor. If the Senate decides not to move forward with medical marijuana, is there anything you can do by executive order to make it easier for people with certain conditions to access it? Uh, we're going to explore that. Uh, first, they should. It is time for the legislature to pass medical marijuana. You see people from every part of every spectrum that are in favor of this. Uh, everyone from a veteran dealing with PTSD to someone who um, has glaucoma to uh, uh, someone that this may be a good alternative to uh, other pain prescriptions. And it is medical marijuana. It is regulated. It has uh, 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 the requirement for uh, prescription or, or other medical uses. Uh, so it's, it's something that we will look at. Uh, its time has certainly come. If it's research that, that is the claim that's holding it up, maybe this administration can get that done. Uh, this should have happened before I became governor. I've supported it every year that I've been governor and the people demand it. They should know that as governor, I am for medical marijuana and I will continue to push it until we make it a reality. Thank you all very much.